right. So we are in teaching number four, maintaining sound doctrine, on bottom of page seven. So how do we do preventative medicine? That's good, right? To prevent all of this from even happening in the first place. Um, where Jesus heals people, and you see those statements, your faith has made you well, you've been healthy, uh, you, you've been made whole, all those words there in Greek language, it's a word that Paul will use for sound doctrine in the pastoral epistles. First, second Timothy, Titus, healthy, well, sound doctrine. And I just want to state this very clearly to you. Healthy doctrine, healthy believers. Sick doctrine, sick believers. You can write that down. If you're teaching what's wrong, people teach what's wrong, it's going to affect their spiritual health for sure. Uh, years ago, I had a talk with the Lord about the sheep he had given me. I was kind of frustrated dealing with people. Why do they keep straying? Why am I always having to chase? Why are they going over here? Why do they miss church? Why am I having to, you know, I, was, I had this kind of complaint with the Lord. And the Lord spoke a word to me right out of Scripture, spoke to my heart and said, son, you are a pastor, and that's what your job description includes. Go after straying sheep. <laughs> that's going to be part of your job. And you too, also, you as believers here, you're going to have to go after people. And so what does the Bible say over and over? Sheep are always straying. Interestingly, that word strain is the word planeo. It's where we get the English word for planet. And guess what? Everywhere in the New Testament where you see planeo, it's the word deceive, it's the word error, it's the word to be seduced. So the main Greek word for deception, to be deceived, is the same word used for strain. And so I say this, strain sheep are deceived sheep very often. And we see that, right, in the scriptures, and I list all these scriptures here, Hebrews 3, James, Matthew 18, Psalm 119, 1 Peter 2, Isaiah 53, verse 6, you guys know we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Write it down. If you're an elder, you're a pastor, you're a church leader, sheep are always going to be strained. Don't complain, don't worry about it. That's part of your job description. Reach out to them in love. Go back and get them. Bring them back in. Go as the, the real shepherd does in the natural. They, you break their legs. <laughs> I called some, this one guy. I told him, hey, I'm coming. He goes, why are you coming over, Pastor? I go, I'm coming over there to break your legs. Because that's what they do. The shepherds break the leg. They let the, put the sheep on the shoulders and carry them around. They massage the legs and they heal up the legs and then they put them back down again. And so we go after strange sheep. I want to say, how do you maintain sound doctrine? The pastors, the youth leaders, the men's ministry, women's ministry, Sunday school, regular preparation, presentation week by week is critical to how that church will maintain sound doctrine. We must have thoughtful study, careful exegesis, insightful research, and clear presentations. We don't show up. I tell our Sunday school teachers, don't just show up. Don't wing it. Don't get up Sunday morning early. These are just little kids. They don't know a whole lot. I can just wait till the last minute. No, we need to pray. We need to seek God. We need to know what we're saying. We need to teach the truth to God. Because as you do that, you just, you're careless about that and you wing it. You just, I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do trust the Holy Spirit, but we're also going to study. We're going to get into the Word. We're going to get examples from the Holy Spirit in prayer about what we, we should share. Top of page 8. Put only thoroughly trained and qualified elders, leaders, youth workers, Sunday school teachers into your leadership. Can they refute false teaching? In Titus 1.9, it says, uh, talking about elders and bishops and pastors and overseers, he says they must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Of the 26 qualifications of uh, elders in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, I wrote a book on it here, this one on the biblical qualifications of church eldership. I have a whole section in here uh, two chapters on being able to teach and being able to teach sound doctrine and refute those who oppose sound doctrine. 
that's part of putting right people into leadership. And I tell you, if you put wrong people into leadership, you're going to have a lot of problems in your church. <clears throat> what should you teach? Well, teach the whole counsel of God. Uh, my modus operandi, why I get up every morning and I'm, what I'm very passionate about, uh, I'm assuming some of you in whatever area of ministry you're in, youth ministry, women's ministry, whatever, you have your certain passions. My passion is Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They're not hurt. They're not wounded. They're not injured. They're destroyed. A very strong Hebrew word. They're destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And everywhere I go, whenever I travel, whenever I go overseas in the United States, in California, or across the street, people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. They need to be taught the whole counsel of God. Sheep need to be fed with God's word. And so this is, this is huge. They're destroyed. Isaiah 5, 3, my people have gone into captivity. They're slaves. Why? Because they have no knowledge. People need to be taught, trained, discipled in the truths of God's word. <clears throat> when you're teaching at every level, whether it's behind a pulpit, in a youth class, a women's ministry, men's ministry, whatever you're involved in, uh, the Bible gives us a one. I love this uh, passage here in, uh, in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. There was the big four. I call them the big four of all teaching when he talked to them uh, there about teaching sound doctrine. Your doctrine, Paul said to Titus, must show integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that the one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. Huge words. I encourage you to go home and just meditate. Define these words. Integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech. When you get behind any kind of uh, context where you're teaching other people, you need to do it with complete integrity, you need to do it with holiness and reverence, praying, seeking God's face. You need to do it where you're incorruptible, where you've studied to show yourself approved unto God. You need to really give yourself over to this so that what you're teaching is sound speech, sound words, sound doctrine, healthy Christians, healthy doctrine. I can't emphasize that enough. That's why a lot of Christians today are sick. They're not sick necessarily physically they're sick emotionally they're sick in their soul they're sick in their spirit because they have not been taught properly and it's a very serious thing to stand behind the pulpit and teach the word of god in any level when i first was ordained as a bible teacher uh, many years ago i stood up and they laid hands on me my pastor and the church leadership laid hands on me to become a bible teacher and uh, I put myself under James chapter 3, verse 1. I stood up, I opened my Bible, I go, I want everybody to go to James chapter 1, three, chapter 3, verse 1, and I read this to the congregation. I says, my brothers, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I told the congregation, and to this day, I said, I am going to really give myself to thorough study prayer, research. I'm going to study, 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 pray, 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 read, read, read. I'm going to get input from other pastors. I'm going to get input from other commentaries. I'm going to learn. I'm going to teach it right. I want to be sound in my doctrine. And I'm putting myself under this scripture. And I want you to hold me accountable too. If you see me going off, I want you to stop me and correct me. And I think we need to take this seriously because I'm going to stand before Jesus. And I'm going to give an account for what I taught. It's got to be right. And I don't, I, those books back there, that's a lot of time and effort and God's grace and mercy, I know. But we got to teach it right. And we got to teach it where we love people, we love the truth. And we're not just winging it on Sunday morning. I'm a, I hope it comes out right. No, we need to know the Holy Spirit is with us. And we need to have that confidence when we stand before people that I prepared my heart. The anointing is in the preparation. When you get on your knees before God and you're, you're in the word and you know the word and you've, you've sifted it through other people and other pe leaders and you know what you're saying, you have confidence. It's so important. Study. 
and know the creeds, the confessions of the early church. I just want to give you that as a little homework assignment. Get a, get a good book on, on the creeds. Learn the creeds. Learn what the early church put together as sound doctrine. It'll give you the, the boundaries. It'll give you the barriers. It'll help protect you from jumping over fences when you see what the early church, how they defined the nature of Christ, was huge in all those creeds, the nature of Christ, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, all those creeds were huge. They really took time. They carefully sought it out. These, a lot of these people, that was their native language was Greek. So they, they knew what they were dealing with when they were talking about some of the things about the nature of Jesus. So know these things. Read a good book. Uh, on heresies and false teaching and church history or, or sound doctrine. Something that uh, uh, Bruce Shelley, Professor Bruce Shelley says, he says, as a qu consequence of our ignorance concerning church history, we find believers vulnerable to the appeals of the cultists. You ever read uh, Shelley's book on church history? <laughs> You know what the church history has been? It's been a history of dealing with cults and false teachings. That's what it's been. These offshoots and these, these thousands of denominations and thousands of people coming up with thousands of different things. And he says, man, if you just learn your history and you read a little bit about the creeds and read about what the early church and the bishops and the church fathers who loved God, who were some of them were persecuted to death, if you would read what they said, they held on to the sound doctrine that they were taught. And we need to grab a hold of what they were saying. And we need to grab a hold of what the word of God is saying. And I know that you guys agree with that. Warning, perhaps the most disappointing area of study and interpretation among Bible and Christians is eschatology. Most Christians know about left behind novels and the late great planet Earth, but they've never done a systematic teaching on the second coming or the final resurrection or the day of the Lord. You know what? If, if we had sifted the secret rapture teaching, the pre trib rapture teaching, if we had sifted it through the early church history, for 1,800 years, there was no secret rapture teaching. Did you guys know that? 1,800 years, there was nothing that said Jesus was coming secretly to take the church out here seven years before. There was nothing like that in any church history. I just want to tell you that. That's why I wrote this book on the end times. And I'll give anybody $1,000, $1,000, I promise. Nobody's ever challenged me on this. I'll give you $1,000 if you can find somewhere in the Bible that says we get taken out of here seven years in advance. I'll give you $1,000. And you can read my book and... I'll give you a thousand. I promise. I will write. I'll give. I, I will hand it to you in cash. You can find that in the Bible. You won't find it. It's never. It was never in church history. It was first preached in 1832 in November in in, the, in Great Britain. That's where it was first preached. Nobody ever taught that. The early church never taught that. We need to find out what the early church taught. We need to find out what the early church fathers taught. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit passionate here about this. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, I remember teaching a fault. I, I remember teaching a, a, a end time seminar, eight hours of teaching. I brought pastors in from all over California. There was about seventy pastors at our church. We gave them free books. We gave them free lunch. We sat down. They were in our congregation, set up just like this. There was tables and chairs everywhere. They came in, and I asked them, "How many of you have read any of the Left Behind novels by Tim LaHaye?" Every hand went out. How many of you have read Hal Lindsey's book on the late great planet Earth? Every hand went up. And I said, "How many of you have done a systematic study on your own from the Bible on the resurrection, the final resurrection, the second coming of Jesus, or the day of the Lord?" One guy raised his hand. One pastor raised his hand. And I said, where did you get that? He said, I went to one of your seminars years ago. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, you're cheating. <laughs> you haven't done it. He goes, no, I know. You, I, I went to your seminar. Hey, brothers, that's a statement. We've gotten it from other books, but we haven't gotten it from here ourselves. So we're convinced about it. <clears throat> Know and be able to give clear, straightforward teachings on the incarnation, resurrection, nature of Jesus. Just those three right there are huge. It'll save you from all the cults. Hebrews 1, by the way, is the greatest revelation in the whole Bible on the nature of Jesus, his deity for sure. You ought to study Hebrews 1. It's powerful. Colossians 1, those verses. John, of course, the word became flesh. He was in the beginning. You need to know those. I would also, this is very, very powerful. This is a great study. I encourage all of you to do this. 
go and do a Bible study on the six foundational doctrines of the Christian faith there in Hebrews chapter 6, right? Repentance, faith in God, doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, the rapture, resurrection of Jesus, and, and the eternal judgment. Go study that. I mean, it, that'll take you six months right there to study that. Go see what the Bible says. These are the foundation stones. We need to move on to maturity for sure, but we need to have the foundation before we can build anymore. We need to have these down. And by the way, they're in correct order. You need to repent, then have faith in God, and then get water baptized, and then get spirit baptized, and then have people lay hands on you to go do uh, ministry. And then at the end, if you've died in Christ, you're going to get raised from the dead, and uh, the eternal judgment will be for all those. We're all going to be judged. We're all going to stand before the Lord. It's a beautiful order, but it's a very powerful thing to talk and, and learn. Establish, you can do a new, new believers class, teach people basic doctrine. Years ago, when I first got into the pastoral ministry, I was in, in the 80s, I was living in Ohio, and the Lord spoke to my heart. Every question that they ask Jesus in the Gospels, they're going to ask you. So go find out what Jesus answered the question. Isn't that amazing? So many of the parables, so many of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith came because somebody walked up to Jesus and said, tell us about the Sabbath. Uh, when are you coming back? Hey, what about divorce? So go answer all those questions that Jesus asked. It's an amazing study. Go, go, go look and look at all the, pe all the questions people said. Jesus gave long teaching, and we need to know what he said because he is the truth. Here's a key, my prayer for you, a key thing about uh, maintaining sound doctrine. I love this, and I want to read it out of John 7, and then we're going to stop and take a break here. <clears throat> what did Jesus say? Isn't this, isn't this amazing? Jesus, who is the truth. The truth is in Jesus, the eternal Son of God, making this statement, my doctrine is not mine. Wow. And I want to tell you right now, my doctrine is not mine. It's not mine. But it's his who sent me. And notice this, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But I love this, I love this, I love this, I love this. He who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. It's not your doctrine. It belongs to the Lord. You must be doing his will. And that's how you can tell whether a doctrine is from God. If the person has been practicing it. Deception comes when we are not practicing what we preach. Remember what uh, James said? It, you need to be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James 1. We're deceiving ourselves if we're not putting into practice what we're learning from the word. And this is absolutely critical for a good heart to maintain sound doctrine and, and, and purity in this area. We, you and I are absolutely seeking the glory of the one who sent us. That is our focus. I come and teach here this morning because I want the glory of God in my life. This is critical. All right, let's, we're going to take a break here, but let's break up for just a minute. Let's ask this question. What one thing can you do to better equip yourself to handle false teaching when it comes? Now, let's all assume that we all need to get into the Word more and spend time. Okay, so let's, let's, let's not use that, hey, I'm going to read more of the Bible. No, what can you do? Can you go read something? Can you learn the creeds? Can you, can you go talk to somebody that maybe you can learn or, or go to a school or take a class? What, 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 what can you do? so that you can be better equipped to deal with false teaching. Answer that question. And honor, glory and power, be unto the 